Welcome everybody. My name is Cynthia Cook and I'm the president of the board of the Clinton Historical Society. And we are delighted to have this gathering from all over the country to hear about the Living New Deal this evening with Gray Brecken, um, an old friend from my days when I was director of the Roosevelt Library. But um, today I'm doing other things and the thing I'm doing is um, hosting this hosting this program while those of you who are coming in are being admitted. So you'll have to forgive me if I'm um, not able to do two things at once, but I, I did just want to um, say thank you to, to not only Gray and Kurt from the Living New Deal, but also to Barbara Sweet, who is our chairman, chairwoman of the um, programs for the Clinton Historical Society. And she has done a, a fantastic job organizing this and you'll be hearing from her a little bit um, in a few, probably next. But um, I'm not going to, because we have groups from all over, I don't think I'm going to do my usual thing, but uh, which is, well, I think I will. I would like you to know that we do programs via Zoom every Friday. Uh, start first, video. Every first Friday in um, every, of every month from September through June. And um, this is um, our Happy New Year program to kick off the new year. And I hope to wish all of you a, um, the best 2022, far better than the past two years, I hope. Uh, just to let you know that next month on the um, 4th of February, we will have a, a program in honor of Black History Month, which, oh, which, is, which is the Red-Tailed Angels, which is a story, we're going to show a film that was produced when I was at the FDR library, which is, it was produced in 2005 or six, six. Um, and it has interviews with some of the last remaining Tuskegee Airmen at the time. And then that'll be followed by a discussion uh, by Gregory Edmonds, who is the president of the Ohio Memorial Chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen. And then the following month, we will be hearing from a local historian, Shannon Butler, who is going to talk about um, extracting the truth from the trade, the Delano, the Delano family, as in Franklin Delano, the Delano family at home and in China. So we're actually kicking off the new year with a lot of sort of Roosevelt related programs, but I think that's entirely appropriate since we are here in Dutchess County, the home of Franklin Roosevelt. And so without much further ado, I am going to turn the program over to our program chair, Barbara Sweet, and she will take it from there. Barbara? Thank you, Cynthia, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name's Barbara Sweet, and I manage all the programs for the Clinton Historical Society, and I'm delighted to welcome each of you to this virtual talk titled the New Deal comes to and transforms Dutchess County. Our gathering's on Zoom, and it's also being recorded. We're thrown in. Oops. Our gathering, yeah. those of you uh, who came in later, uh, would you kindly turn off your microphones, if you would? In fact, okay. I'm, going, I'm going to mute everybody, and that, that, should take care of that, okay? Okay. There, okay. I've to unmute myself. Okay. <clears throat> we have folks um, with us tonight who are in many different time zones from across the United States. Uh, if you would like to watch the talk again or know someone who would like to view it, it will be posted on our website in a few days. Some geography and history for those of you who are with us from a distance. Dutchess County is located uh, about halfway uh, between the two towns or cities of Albany, New York, and New York City. And it's on the east side of the Hudson River. The uh, township of Clinton in Dutchess County is northeast adjacent to Hyde Park, uh, which is adjacent to the Hudson River. Hudson Park is the birth, 
uh, Hyde Park is the birthplace of Franklin Roosevelt and one of his summer homes also. On the grounds, one can find the Roosevelt home run by the National Park Service. And on an adjacent piece of property, there's the Franklin D. Roosevelt Library and Museum, and that's run by the National Archives and Records Administration. Um, it was also the first of all the presidential libraries. Before we get started with Dr. Brecken's talk tonight, I've asked uh, Kurt, who is director of development at the Living New Deal in California, to say a few words about the organization, what it is, where to go to read, watch some of their activities of the organization, and what it's doing across the United States. So Kurt, go ahead. Thanks, Barbara. And uh... Good evening, everyone. I, I see some familiar faces out there, some of my team, team members from the Living New Deal. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background before Gray's talk. Uh, the Living New Deal is a nonprofit organization that is popularizing, popularizing the idea of a new New Deal for our own times. Uh, the Living New Deal was founded at the University of California at Berkeley about a dozen years ago in, as a project of the geography department. Uh, it was the brainchild of tonight's speaker, Gray Brecken. Our team now stretches from the West Coast to the East Coast with uh, dozens of volunteers and researchers and associates across the country. Uh, I'm speaking to you tonight from Portland, Oregon. The Living New Deal maintains a growing website that documents what the New Deal built from post offices to parks, from schools to sidewalks to city halls. Our site also is a clearinghouse for information about the New Deal programs, personalities, policies, and useful history. Because the project was founded by geographers, much of our focus has to do with maps. The showpiece of our website is our online map that now records over 16,000 New Deal sites verified by our researchers. We know this is just a fraction of the thousands of sites remaining to be recorded. Our team and individuals all over the country submit more sites all the time. Over 1 million people made use of our website last year, educators, students, historians, preservationists, and scholars. I invite you to check out our website at livingnewdeal.org. That's livingnewdeal.org, and that uh, URL is posted in the chat box. In addition to the online map, we've also published three printed maps to New Deal Art and Public Works for San Francisco, New York City, and Washington, DC. These guides illustrate the extensive and enduring impact of, that the New Deal made, which is often underappreciated by the public. So the Living New Deal's mission is to preserve the New Deal's legacy, to make people aware of what the New Deal was and did, and to promote the New Deal as a model for governing today. We aim to educate the public about the New Deal's pivotal role during a period of national crisis. Thank you for your interest in our project. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Gray Brecken. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Let's see. Well, that should do it, but it's not. I'm going to. There, there it is. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. That was, yeah. Okay. Now you might want to make it there. There okay. we go. Perfect. Okay. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, uh, Cynthia asked me to 
to do this talk about a year ago. And of course I said, sure, because that seems so far away. And, uh, but in the last few months it's rolled around and I realized I had to do it. And it's been absolutely fascinating to do it because although I'm sure many of you know the county much better than I do, Hyde Park is Mecca for those of us in the Living New Deal and our sister organization, the National New Deal Preservation Association. So this talk is specifically about Dutchess County, although I'm gonna give you a little introduction before we get there. Of course, when Roosevelt came into office in 1933, the, the country was in the pits of the Great Depression. And scenes like this, this is a photograph by Dorothea Lang for the Farm Securities Administration, scenes like this, were common all over the country. And it should not seem all that strange because of course they are common all around the country now as well too. In fact, although the stock market is doing very well, um, what's happened is the depression has been privatized so that individuals are now living in their own great depression as well too. Well, in 1933, as I say, the country was really rock bottom. And when Roosevelt came in, he understood that um, if he didn't do something quickly and boldly, there could be a revolution or another civil war and there would be no United States. This, by the way, is a uh, fresco in Coit Tower in San Francisco done under the Civil Works Administration. Roosevelt, of course, had a magnificent speaking voice and he was able to use the new social media of radio with his fireside chats and just the way he spoke. Um, he solidified the country and imbued in it a sense of great um, confidence and in, in individuals, the self-esteem, which so many of them had lost through the work relief programs. This is from his second inaugural address at the FDR Memorial in Washington. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. That's a statement you haven't heard from the White House in quite some time. And the point I wanna make is that the Roosevelt's, both of them, were practicing rather than professing Christians. They believed that it was their duty to help those less fortunate than themselves. And financially, most people were, of course, but um, the, the fact is that many of the people who worked in the New Deal, whom they surrounded themselves with, had earlier worked in the settlement house movement, including Eleanor Roosevelt herself. And that was a very idealistic organization. I'll be giving a talk later on uh, this month to the Ruskin Society about that because Ruskin was the one who inspired much of the settlement house movement. Now, uh, this is our website. Uh, what we do, as Kurt said, is we locate and map the public works of the New Deal because you can map them, but there's a great deal more than that. What I say about the uh, public works is that they're trying to speak to us in a lost ethical language, and that's what has come to interest me the most. So I often liken the Living New Deal to an archaeological dig. Um, we're uncovering a lost civilization that happens to be ours. My parents built it. They just forgot to tell us about it. And then the, uh, the matrix of what they built at that time has been lost, sort of buried to memory. So this is what happened. It started out actually as the Living New Deal of California. And we began using some sort of primitive technology to locate what was going on in California. And then we found, we, it, you dropped down a rabbit hole and we decided to expand to the rest of the country. And so this is what happened over the years. So what this represents is a nation transformed in about eight years, radically transformed. Now we've changed to a different platform because you couldn't see the country anymore. So uh, the dots have gotten smaller. You can click on each dot and it will bring up uh, a project. And as Kurt said, we're actually just scratching the surface. You can see actually how um, thick the dots are in New York City. And we have produced a map which you can carry around with you when you're in New York. But you can see also that there are a lot of dots up the Hudson, a lot over in Connecticut, a lot around Boston. Um, and th the problem is that 
almost all of these projects are unmapped, um, unmarked. Uh, people don't know that they are New Deal. They don't recognize that they use them all the time. It's a matrix. There's an exception. We have a chapter now in New York City and they've come up with this sign and they are now putting the signs on New Deal projects in New York City, which was the only major city I've ever been in where I never saw a WPA marker. That's not accidental. That's probably because Robert Moses and Franklin Roosevelt hated one another. And so uh, that is now being corrected. We have associates around the country who do research and send us information. Uh, this is Evan. We're doing research here at the National Archives. And that's Brent, who's on the call tonight. Now, I'm going to give you just a brief primer on the various work uh, relief agencies, because you're going to be hearing about them in relation to Dutchess County. The Civil Works Administration, most people have never heard of it, the CWA, it only lasted for about five months, and it was created by executive order in the winter of 1933 by Roosevelt to get the country through a very harsh winter so that millions of people did not starve and freeze. And it gave jobs to a lot of people, and they received checks directly from the Treasury. So this is just some, um, some CWA workers creating a boulevard in San Francisco. Here they are um, building a street, a road in San Francisco. You can see that they downplayed heavy machinery so that more men could have work. It would be as if when this guy came to office in 2008, he had created 14 million jobs in two months because Harry Hopkins, who was in charge of it, created 4 million jobs in just that amount of time. Now, these are some WPA posters, and uh, they show you the kind of work that was being done at that time. The point is that the work that was created by the New Deal agencies was socially beneficial work. This was the kind of work, generally, that the free market cannot or would not provide. This was socially beneficial work, and it united people and also gave them proud pride in what they were doing. Uh, the CCC was Roosevelt's idea. It started off with a bang in 1933. Um, and um, ultimately, it employed three and a half million young men. And um, they did an amazing amount of work. They managed the forest. They did soil conservation. Um, they improved accessibility to our national parks and national forests, which were expanding at that time under Roosevelt's administration. And... Oh, well, yes, I'll come to that. Um, they were in individual camps of 200 men apiece. There were about 4,000 of them across the country um, at the peak of the CCC. And among other things, they fought fires. So um, for those of us out here in the West, it seems like it's about time to have another CCC. It should be revived, actually. And of course, Biden has proposed a civilian climate corps, and we desperately need that because also what they did was they provided emergency relief work when there was a natural disaster. And we need a core like that. Then there was the WPA, the best known of the agencies because it did leave some markers behind it. And it lasted for about eight years and it did everything from building roads to women sewing clothes for indigent families, to composing and conducting symphonies. It left a lot of art behind you, which you'll see. The Public Works Administration was under Harold Ickes in the Interior Department, and that did the big projects. It contracted out companies, many of which got their start at that time, like Bechtel and Kaiser, to do the really big public works projects like sewage treatment plants, storm drains here in Los Angeles, bridges, most of which are still being used. This one is right in my backyard, the Bay Bridge, and the big dams and airports as well too. We take these for granted. Um, and many of them are 80 years old because they were provided, built at that time. The point here is that these projects, these physical projects were built not just to put people to work, but to increase public health in its broadest possible dimensions. And that includes, for example, education, as you will see, the public health of the individuals and of the society itself. Now, finally, we get to Dutchess County. So here it is, as Barbara said, it's on the east side of the Hudson River. 
The Catskills are on the other side. It's right hard up against Connecticut. What's going on here? Um, there's not much going on in Eastern Dutchess County. And that's not because there's nothing there, as you will see. Um, it's because you guys haven't been doing the work that you need to do to feed us that information. But you're way ahead of all Ulster County across the river because I know that there's a lot of stuff in the Catskills and we don't have anything there. Now, this was me about 12 years ago when I met Cynthia. I was working at the FDR library, having a, just a great time going through the kind of records that they have there. At that time, I was mostly interested in the photographs and some of those you will see, um, but there was so much much else there, and I've never been able to spend as much time as I would like, and I hope to correct that if we can just get past this pandemic. Uh, Roosevelt, of course, was the most famous resident of Dutchess County, and uh, his family had been there since at least the 18th century. He loved the place, and he strongly identified with it. But, and this is a sign outside, which just shows, you know, what it meant to him. But his love was not requited often because the county was overwhelmingly Republican and um, did not vote for him. And he wanted the New Deal projects in Dutchess County to be a model for the rest of the country. But sometimes, perhaps even often, they would actually reject the projects that were offered to them. This is a full page um, ad for the Republican um, County Committee in the Poughkeepsie Eagle News. And it says, um, protest and repudiate the New Deal. Every Democratic candidate is allied and associated in one way or another with the New Deal. You can't split the vote for any Democrat if you want to make a real protest. Vote every Republican candidate in the city or county. And then this is uh, Winthrop Aldrich, who was the chair of Chase Bank. And um, he was a neighbor. And of course, he said that the um, New Deal was from the straight out of Karl Marx. So this must have been very interesting for the Roosevelts because here were their neighbors with these great estates, many descendants of the Livingstons, including Eleanor herself. Um, and um, of course, Franklin was seen by some of these neighbors as a traitor to his class, even though, of course, we know that there is not a class system in the United States, all evidence to the contrary. Now, this is actually an, uh, another article from the Poughkeepsie Eagle News, and it shows the bent of that newspaper that this gym, which was going to be provided in Poughkeepsie by the WPA, was it's couched as a burden because the city would have to pay a share of the cost of the gym. The WPA would pay most of it, but the, the city actually had to pay some money for the gym. And so in a way, it's kind of um, asking you to repudiate these, the gym and other public works as well. But this cartoon in the Eagle News shows that one man's boondoggle is another man's necessity, especially when it comes to road construction. So, um, I mean, there are a lot of really funny uh, political cartoons in the Eagle News as well as other newspapers at that time. But the newspapers on the United States, the larger ones at least, were were very largely against Roosevelt, particularly the Hearst chain of newspapers. Hearst called Roosevelt more communist than the communists themselves. And that's largely because Roosevelt instituted progressive taxation in order to pay for the New Deal. And that really put a crimp in Hearst's building of San Simeon as well as his building of other uh, castles as well too. Well, Here's a, uh, a mural, which probably many of you know, it's in the Hyde Park Post Office. It's one of the very few in the country that has a, a picture of Roosevelt. And in this case, he's in his open top convertible, um, checking out the plans for the Hyde Park um, Elementary School um, with one of his farmer neighbors looking on. And of course there's Fala near the running board. And Roosevelt, saw, thought of himself as actually um, an architect in the vein of his predecessor, Thomas Jefferson. And so he had a great deal to do with the design of a lot of the buildings you're about to see. Well, here is that elementary school, right in the heart of Hyde Park. It's in Dutch colonial style, 
and you're going to see a lot of that. It's in Fieldstone, which he insisted on. And unfortunately, it's not being used, I understand, right now as an elementary school. It has other functions, including, I believe, a kindergarten and administrative functions. But it's a very handsome building in which um, Roosevelt had a hand. Uh, down the road is the Franklin Delano, um, let's see, that was the high school, I believe. And again, it's Fieldstone. And it's kind of a strange melange of Dutch colonial and Palladium. Uh, and I think Roosevelt felt that this was appropriate for these large institutional buildings. Um, smaller ones would be more humble. This is a beautiful building. I was fortunate enough to get into it, and it's very difficult to get into schools, New Deal schools these days, which makes it very frustrating. Um, but the detailing in this building is absolutely beautiful. And Roosevelt had a hand in all of this. Uh, it's, it takes its cue from um, colonial buildings in the county. And fortunately, it does have two plaques in it. Uh, it always makes my day when I can get into one of these buildings and see uh, plaques like this that identify it as a New Deal project. Here's one that actually has Roosevelt's name on it, not just as the namesake of the high school, but um, having a great deal to do with the, uh, the creation of the building. Then there's the Violet Avenue Elementary School looking much like the Roosevelt High School, um, a sort of Dutch colonial Palladium building. And then up the road, up the river, is um, the Red Hook Central School. This is a very large school, uh, which I visited um, with a local uh, who went to school there. And this is, like many of the New Deal schools, a union school. That is, it um, agglomerated or brought in students from much smaller rural schools and provided them with facilities that they couldn't have out in the country, for example, in one-room schoolhouses, in a large modern school. Um, this is a uh, newspaper article at the time saying that Roosevelt was going to come to dedicate this, but this was just a day before September 1st, 1939, the day at which Germany invaded Poland, and Roosevelt had other things on his mind at that time and had to skip the dedication of this school. Uh, the detailing on this school, as in so many other New Deal schools, is just magnificent. This is uh, terracotta. This is the wing for the arts, showing the, um, the drama, music, and painting. Um, you can just study these buildings, actually, because they just didn't stint on the detailing that went into them. Then Beacon um, got a, a high school edition. Uh, this one is in the Living New Deal website. And then here in Amenia in eastern um, Dutchess County, we don't have this on our map. I only recently discovered it. The Amenia Public Library, um, which is by this a newspaper clip, a WPA project. And here it is today. Um, it's pretty spiffy. And I have to thank Betsy Strauss for telling me about this. Uh, she informed me of this and said that um, she thinks that the library in Pauling may also be a WPA building. So it's up to you guys to check on this and confirm that. Um, is there a plaque in it? Um, maybe there is a newspaper clipping. Go to the reference librarian and find out. Now, the buildings that you probably are all familiar with um, is, um, are the post offices, because Roosevelt had a hand in designing um, five post offices in Dutchess County and another one across the river in Ellenburg. Um, and uh, these are absolutely fascinating. They're some of the finest post offices in the country, both small and large, this of course being Hyde Park. And the reason that they have art in them um, is thanks to, largely, to two women. One is Eleanor Roosevelt and her friend and neighbor, Eleanor Morgenthau, because Eleanor Morgenthau's husband was the Secretary of Treasury, Henry Morgenthau. And these projects, these art projects that are in post offices around the country are not WPA as people commonly think. They're under two different projects within the Treasury Department, which paid for them. And so this is actually a fresco in Coit Tower in San Francisco, which honors the men who were involved in the 
uh, federal art projects, but Eleanor is right there. Uh, Ellen, I don't believe the woman in the back is Eleanor Morgenthau. The purpose of this, of all this art, was democratizing beauty. I've written about this because both of the Roosevelts, like those of their class, had experienced beauty by going to on the grand tour around Europe. And they felt that Americans should all be entitled to that. Holger Cahill, who was the head of the Federal Art Project, said that FDR was more deeply interested in the arts than any other president since Thomas Jefferson. And it is doubtful that any head of state since the Renaissance has equaled him as a patron of the living arts. So we'll, we're gonna go up the river and look at these post offices that Roosevelt had a heavy hand in designing. First is the Beacon Post Office, a beautiful building, um, which has a mural. I had to take this out of a, um, of a book. Um, so I really need a photograph, a good photograph of this mural of, which is a map obviously of the Hudson and uh, the counties along it. Um, and here I have to interject that this is a book that um, local historian Helen Wilkinson Reynolds um, published with an introduction by Franklin Roosevelt in 1929 for the Holland Society. It's a subject that interested them both enormously, Dutch houses of the Hudson Valley before 1776. And um, Reynolds did an enormous amount of research on this, and, but Roosevelt was also involved and he was fascinated by these buildings because they of course also represented his ancestry and probably as well, uh, Eleanor's ancestry as well. So many, several of these post offices are designed like Dutch colonial houses, such as this beautiful one in Wappingers Falls, which has a mural um, showing the falls with the mill uh, along it, um, probably in the 18th century. And again, I need a better photograph of this. Then up the river is Poughkeepsie, the, the only major city in Dutchess County. And um, here we have this palatial post office, one of my favorites in the country um, that Roosevelt had a hand in designing, as well as designing or helping um, Merritt Spidell, the owner of the Poughkeepsie um, Eagle News, designed his building in the same style, uh, just catty corner to it. Uh, this has a beautiful plaque showing that Franklin Roosevelt had a hand in this, as well as Henry Morgenthau. And no expense seems to have been spared on this building. Um, it really, any city would be proud to have a building like this, just the materials, craftsmanship, and then the art on both uh, the, the ground floor and the mezzanine level. Um, this is a really first rate art showing the history of the area which interested Reynolds and Roosevelt so much. This was shown to me actually by Chris Bryseth, and there's Chris actually looking at one of these wonderful murals. I think this was the, um, the uh, ratification of the Constitution by uh, New York State. Um, and then this beautiful mural of some of the local gentry with those Dutch colonial buildings in the background. And then on the first floor um, above the postmaster's window is a, a panorama by a local woman, a Georgiana Kiltgaard of Bearsville. Um, very typical of uh, murals that you'll see in post offices around the country. Uh, nothing controversial about this. This is not social realism. It's sort of just the American scene showing Poughkeepsie going up the hill from the river and a bridge that was built when Roosevelt was governor, or rather completed when he was governor. Then of course, Hyde Park, one of my favorites, um, again, like a Dutch colonial house, but spectacular on the inside for the murals by Olin Dows, who was a local artist distantly related uh, to Roosevelt. And it shows scenes of local history. Um, um, this is bringing up a sturgeon, the likes of which will never be seen in that stretch of the um, Hudson ever again. But it also shows that there were blacks at that time um, in the valley, um, whether free or slave. And um, 
the kind of rural scene, the, 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 the relaxation of the local gentry, I think that's St. James Church over there, which of course was the church of the Roosevelt's, and then Top Cottage, Roosevelt's retreat uh, for the famous picnic for the King and Queen of England. And there is Top Cottage itself. And again, you can see Roosevelt's fascination and, and uh, fondness for Dutch colonial architecture and for fieldstone. Even when a building was um, originally a frame building, he would reinterpret it with fieldstone. And historic fieldstone, if possible, salvaged from historic buildings of the time. Now, Rhinebeck is a really special case. It's a beautiful post office um, right in the heart of Rhinebeck, next to the Beekman Arms. And it's wonderful on the inside. Again, with, oh, here's another plaque um, showing that His Royal Highness Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark and Iceland dedicated the building. Morgenthau was there. James Farley, I believe, was there. And of course, the lobby is surrounded by these wonderful murals by Olin Dows, including this one, which I hear has been rather controversial because it shows that there were slaves in the Hudson Valley. And actually, uh, Helen Reynolds makes a point. She actually writes about slavery in the Hudson Valley. And it wasn't until I saw this mural that I was ever aware that there was slavery in the Hudson Valley. So this is a very important depiction showing the kind of basis of the wealth of the Hudson Valley, at least part of it. There is, There was, when I was there, this historic um, a display there, but I think that there's going to be a more sophisticated one to explain what is going on here. Now, uh, this isn't a, a, a PWA hospital in your county. This is actually in so Sonoma here in California because I couldn't find any photographs of all the hospitals that were improved by the PWA and the WPA in Dutchess County. Um, these are the hospitals that you probably recognize. Hudson River State Hospital, Matia Wan Hospital, Bourne Memorial Hospital, Harlem Valley Hospital, Clinton State Hospital, Poughkeepsie Hospital Infirmary, and Castle Point Veterans Hospital. These were all improved by New Deal projects at that time. So I said that it was, um, the goal was to improve public health. Well, that just gives you an idea of improving the health of individual, uh, of, of physical health, also mental health as well too. Um, but this was a quantum leap forward in the provision of health to people, public health. Uh, another way that public health was um, improved was through the provision and expansion of public parks and recreation. Um, and um, this is a WPA poster. It appears that the WPA improved virtually every park in the county from what I can make out. And, but that's not uncommon because that happens all around the country. They were put to work, improving the parks, planting trees, grading them, uh, many cities had um, their street trees put in here in Berkeley. Um, we found out that they planted 16,000 street trees. And of course, these are not marked. And they're the glory of the city today. Sacramento would be unlivable without the trees that the WPA planted at that time. But they also provided swimming pools, tennis courts, um, badminton courts, recreational facilities. And um, Dutchess County is no exception. The women of Vassar um, founded a kind of um, settlement house in Poughkeepsie to serve the, um, the um, poor there. Um, I think it was 1916. It was called Lincoln Center. And the WPA built this uh, gym and community center, which was very much used at that time. On the lower left-hand corner, you can see Eleanor Roosevelt giving a talk there to the assembled people. Uh, unfortunately, this building was torched by an arsonist and is no longer standing, but it is in our website. This is a peculiar thing. Um, the, um, this memorial was provided by a local financier, but it was improved by the WPA. And so um, I'd like somebody to go up there and see if there is a plaque uh, signifying that, but I found that out from the Dutchess County WPA guide. And then the Cornell Crew um, Boathouse uh, on Marist College grounds, right on the Hudson River, that's WPA. It's a very large, handsome building. 
But the real recreation was largely provided by the CCC. Now, we tend to think of the CCC as largely a Western kind of thing, but in fact, actually, there was a lot of CCC camps in upstate New York, in the Adirondacks, the Catskills, and along the Hudson River. This is a map I found in the FDR library showing where the camps were. And in particular in the county, uh, they improved Nori State Park. There was a camp right there, and it's distinctive for its beautiful stonework. Uh, which the CCC boys were so good at all across the country. Whenever you go to a national or a state park and you see beautiful stonework, you pretty much know that the boys were there. Uh, this is one of the photographs from the FDR library, but you can just go there and see these beautiful enduring works of stone art. Here is a CCC veteran, Walter Atwood. I think he was in his 90s at that time. He only recently passed away, just shy of 100, standing on one of those bridges. And then the pavilion has beautiful work in it too. It's been converted to an environmental center right on the river. And uh, one of the restrooms there, Dutch colonial, of course. I believe that these rustic buildings, which uh, people can use, are probably built by the CCC. And by going to the FDR library, you can actually look at the um, paper, the newspaper that was uh, uh, produced in that camp, uh, Camp 1274. And uh, a wonderful sort of um, uh, amateur, certain kind of naive artwork. This is one of the CCC boys actually leaving the camp and all of the friends that he's made there. Now I stuck this in, this is actually a camp in California, but I just wanted to correct a common misperception, which is the CCC was racially segregated. Half true. Um, it was actually um, partially integrated from the get go, from 1933, at the insistence of Representative DePriest from Chicago, the only Black in the Congress at that time. And um, so this is a photograph from the FDR library that shows that the integration of one of these camps in California. I don't know whether the camps in um, Dutchess County were uh, integrated at that time. The CCC also improved Connick State Park. Uh, this pond was a creation of the CCC. And then um, the sort of less spectacular stuff that we don't really think about, but we couldn't live without, that is infrastructure. So this is from our website. And you can see that the CWA provided labor for the improvement of Beacon's waterworks, roads, and sewers. And here's road building. Um, we take this for granted. Um, but this is a map I found of, in a WPA publication of one rural county in central Iowa showing all the roads that were improved, made all weather market to farm roads uh, serving Oskaloosa. And this is a very conservative part of the country. They have no idea that every day they are taking advantage of the New Deal by driving over these roads to, to um, deliver their produce and um, do whatever people do. Um, in a rural county like that. And I suspect the same is true for Dutchess County. As a matter of fact, here's a photograph of not a good one of a road near Armenia. This is, was done by the WPA. Also, look to your feet because they did most of the sidewalks in um, Poughkeepsie, Beacon, and probably other cities as well in Dutchess County too. So we're always happy to find WPA stamps like this one, which happens to be in San Francisco. They're disappearing all over uh, because they tend to be at the corners of the sidewalk, which is where we put our curb cuts. So they're disappearing fast. If you find any of these, let us know. Then they did the sewers, storm drains, water supply as well too. Um, one of the local officials said, uh, while a large percentage of our good deeds are buried projects, such as water extension work, the general public does not realize the real value to the city, that is to Poughkeepsie, of uh, putting in the, the storm drains and the sewers without which the city would be mm, very unpleasant and perhaps totally unviable. By the way, the sewers actually, they, they would put them in sometimes retroactively, but they made possible development out into the suburbs. 
And here you can see a clipping from the Eagle News that shows that the Eighth Ward in Poughkeepsie was getting uh, sewers. I strongly suspect that the famous water tower in Tivoli is a WPA project, but I haven't been able to confirm that. So here you can see the amount of money that was being spent in and on Dutchess County, and it was really transforming the whole county. Even little Uniondale, Unionvale, got a $10,000 storage building. Finally, to wrap up, there are the service projects. Now these, we can't map. Um, they didn't leave many traces, but they're fascinating because again, they speak of the lost ethical language. They, the new dealers in particular were concerned about the welfare of children. They knew the children that are mistreated and particularly who are hungry um, are going to be stunted for the rest of their lives. And so that should be taken care of as well as the medical care. And here below, you can see actually that a, a racially integrated kindergarten. I think that the idea was a process of gradualism to um, get children to know one another so that the, the barriers of race would break down. For those of us who are interested in history, uh, we owe an enormous debt to uh, people whose names we don't know, largely women, in the Historical Records Survey, which was part of the WPA, as well as the Federal Rogers Project. These librarians, archivists, and others not only preserved records, they assembled them, they identified them, they bound them, and they made it possible for us to do research today. We're standing on their shoulders. The Federal Writers Project did those famous state guides, which are quite large, but this is just a small one. They did these all over the country, one on Dutchess County. I learned a lot from this one about the history of the county, but also I found several WPA projects. And finally, these projects are still enriching our lives. Um, and yet we don't know who to thank. This is the, um, the uh, library in Amenia, one of the uh, photos that uh, Betsy Strauss sent me. And uh, it shows these people, their lives are being enriched by projects that were built 80 years ago uh, that we have decided that we shouldn't fund or finance much anymore. And so consequently, much of the United States is falling into a state of ruin today, largely because we were persuaded that we shouldn't pay the taxes necessary to create or even maintain all of this wealth that was created at that time. Well, I just wanna wrap up with some WPA posters. And what's interesting when you look at these posters is a, an additional letter that we're not used to seeing much, free. All of these various New Deal projects were free rather than had a, had a fee attached to it. So free or fee, it's the missing R that counts that really determines the quality of the civilization that we're going to have. And at that time, a great deal was free that we no longer take for granted. Well, here's a page from the Living New Deal when we only had just over 15,000. We're closing in on 17,000 sites now. As Kurt said, there's a website. We urge you to go and look at it, roam around in it. I think of it as kind of the Winchester mystery house of the New Deal. You can get completely lost. You can find all sorts of stuff, including 100 New Deal movies that you can watch from the National Archives. Um, have a lot of fun. And also, as I said, find stuff and send it to us so that we can actually put it on the map and enrich it. You're way ahead of Ulster County. I want you to get even farther ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience.